Hi, I'm Mark Schulman. I'm the Dean of Graduate and International Programs at Pace Law School, just down the pike a bit. And uh, I've been asked to moderate this wonderful, extraordinary panel on the legal perspectives on the NPT. W when I teach my uh, new students, I always teach them something you may have encountered, Iraq, not the country that doesn't apparently have weapons of mass destruction, but the method of legal analysis that states issue first, then rule, then application, conclusion. That is, I think, the logic of our, of our day's progress through these questions. In the morning, we had a very uh, compelling set of uh, descriptions about the issue of, of nuclear weapons and, and the risk, the threats that they pose to humanity. In this second, and I would say key panel at a law school, <laughs> Um, we have uh, three exceptionally knowledgeable and experienced lawyers to talk about the rule, to craft the rules that define the prolifer proliferation, non-proliferation, -prol counter-proliferation -prol regimes. Uh, once these wise people sort out the rules for us, then it's a simple matter of working through the application in section three, and then Professor Meyer will give us a conclusion at the end of the day. Um, I a short conclusion. Um, the, uh, I, I'm, I'm so impressed by the, 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 this or, the organization of this, this conference today. I couldn't possibly have come up with three such distinguished uh, practitioners to explain the rules. And we will just go in order, and I won't dwell long on introducing each one of them uh, because uh, I think that their experience so thoroughly informs the perspectives they give that a certain amount of autobiography is built into their presentations. But you should know that the first speaker is John Burroughs. John is an old friend of mine, and I just discovered a classmate at Berkeley where we did our doctorates together. Um, and John is the executive director of the distinguished group in New York City, the Lawyers Committee for Nuclear Policy. Um, after that, Professor Ord Kittry will speak. Uh, Professor Kittry is at the um, uh, Rogers School of Law at, at, Ari right? at the University of Arizona. Arizona State. University. Oh, at Arizona State. Sandra Day at the Sandra Day O'Connor School in, uh, at Arizona State, I beg your pardon. Um, and prior to going into full-time academe, he was uh, in the Office of Legal Advisor at the State Department for 10 years working on these issues. So then you wonder, well, what about the contemporary legal advisor's office? And our, our cleanup speaker, Meha Shah, has been there now for 10 years, working on a variety of portfolios related to international trade and, and security, and works extensively on, on nuclear is issues. So she will uh, wrap up for this, us. I've asked each speaker to contain her or his remarks to about 20 minutes so that there really is some time for dialogue with you. Uh, with that, uh, John Burroughs. Thank you, uh, Mark. It was a pleasant surprise to come here and th find out you were going to be chairing this uh, this panel. Uh, how many of you are law students? Okay, uh, it looks like there's maybe ten or so of you. Uh, so I won't. Uh, some of my remarks will be directed to you as as law students, but I won't <coughs> only speak as if I'm talking to uh, to. Uh, people going into law. Well, uh, let me uh, begin uh, just by letting you know where I'm coming from. <clears throat> uh, this morning, uh, uh, this morning's presentations uh, reminded me of a couple things. One was there was a wonderful man, uh, v uh, very moral in his outlook, a very warm person. His name was Ted Taylor. Well, as it so happened, he was a brilliant nuclear weapons designer at uh, Los Alamos in the early 1950s. Then he worked in the Department of Defense in the 1960s uh, as, uh, you know, at some kind of official level planning, planning for nuclear war. And uh, especially once he found out what the plans were, he said, I just cannot live with this anymore. Uh, and he turned into a nuclear weapons abolitionist. And one thing he used to say, he died a few years ago, one thing he used to say has really stuck with me, it's very simple, nuclear weapons are off the human scale. Uh, so just think about that. They're, they really, they shouldn't be part of our, of our experience. Uh, 
And uh, so this might have been influenced by Jonathan Granoff, but uh, I've been trying to think of, of new ways of talking about uh, these uh, devices, because they really shouldn't be called weapons. Uh, and so the latest thing I've come up with is technopathogen. So these are technopathogens which should be eradicated. So that's, uh, that's where I'm coming from. But I'm, I'm supposed to be talking, and I want to talk about law. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, let me begin with, uh, and you know, lawyers need to think about the institutions that, that underlie the law. Uh, let me begin with a different regime for weapons. That is uh, the chemical weapons uh, regime. There is a global treaty, the Chemical Weapons Convention. Most, virtually all countries in the world are parties to it. It sets up an implementing agency, the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, which monitors the destruction of chemical weapons, conducts inspections, et cetera. It has a council of governments to oversee it. I think it's called an executive council. It has annual meetings of state parties. Those meetings of state parties can uh, collectively decide to impose sanctions against countries not complying with the Chemical Weapons Convention. Uh, so there's a whole structure, structure within the Chemical Weapons Convention for enforcement of, of the global rule against possessing or using uh, chemical weapons, and the U.S. is a party to this. As a matter of fact, George H.W. Bush was, a, was an important uh, figure in bringing the Chemical Weapons Convention about, and I, I don't think the senior George Bush gets enough credit for his accomplishments in the, in the arms control uh, area. But in any case, uh, there's a whole structure within the CWC for enforcement of this, of, of this global rule. Uh, in, in the end, it can be referred to the Security Council. So this is a fairly coherent structure. Uh, I'm afraid this is not the case in, in, in the nuclear area. Uh, the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, got going in the 1950s enters into safeguards agreements with countries regarding their nuclear reactors and did so before the NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, entered into force um, to make sure that uh, materials are not being diverted to use for weapons. So he already had a structure in place when the NPT was negotiated. Then on top of it, the NPT is, doesn't have one rule. It has two rules. One rule is most countries cannot acquire nuclear weapons. The second rule is a few identified countries are supposed to negotiate their, uh, uh, their elimination. Uh, so this gives rise to a lot of incoherence right from the beginning. Uh, so what you have then is the IAEA and its board of governors is kind of like a separate institutional structure. That's really where the action is so far as whether countries are living up to their safeguards obligations not to uh, divert uh, fissile materials to nuclear weapons. And you know that's become clear to all of us, I think, in, in, over the last decade as we've seen how much discussion there is in the IAEA and its board of governors regarding, regarding Iran. The Iran and North Korea situations really are not discussed in any meaningful way uh, in the context of the non-proliferation uh, review proceedings. Now, that could change, but it's so, to date, that's been the situation. It's partly because the NPT review proceedings are conducted so that uh, on the basis of consensus. So if you try to deal with a problem situation like the nuclear weapon states not complying with their disarmament obligation or like non-proliferation uh, norms being violated by uh, countries such as uh, Iran or Iraq or Libya or North Korea, uh, you can paralyze the process of, of review of the treaty and agreement on, on further commitments. Um, so there is no very coherent compliant, compliance and enforcement structure for uh, the non-proliferation regime. Uh, uh, matters can be referred to the Security Council from the IAEA, and that happens sometimes. Uh, they haven't been referred. Uh, states' parties to the Non-Proliferation Treaty have not collectively deliberated <coughs> upon um, uh, on enforcement matters or referred matters to, to the Security Council. 
there is zero uh, 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 enforcement and compliance machinery regarding uh, arms control and disarmament obligations. You only find that uh, uh, is established between uh, Russia and the United States, essentially. Now, when the Test Ban Treaty uh, enters into force, that will change. So we're talking about a patchwork here. There is no annual meeting of the, of the NPT. There's only a five-year meeting of states' parties. They have uh, what are called prep comms for the review meetings every year, but in terms of an uh, annual meeting of states who are empowered to take action, doesn't happen. Um, it, it, it's, uh, there's, there's no uh, disarmament agency. Um, there's no executive council of states. Uh, I've gradually, as I've worked on the non-proliferation treaty over the years, I've gradually come to appreciate uh, how flawed it is, just as 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 sort of a, a, a regime, and then beyond that, there's the the question of is it even possible to really talk about achieving a nuclear weapons free world while at the same time uh, promoting uh, nuclear power? But promoting nuclear power is right at the basis uh, uh, of the non-proliferation treaty, so it's something that has a lot of problems. Um, the International Court of Justice gave an opinion in 1996 on the legality of threat or use of nuclear weapons. <clears throat> um, and uh, one of the things it said, oh, this was perfectly clear, but it had to say it, there is no global treaty rule banning the threat of use of nuclear weapons. Therefore, the ICJ had to consider whether there are customary rules uh, that that uh, regulate and ban the threat of use of nuclear weapons. And they said the threat of use is uh, generally banned. But in the course of saying that uh, there is no global treaty-based rule, uh, <coughs> the, 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 uh, the court said this, the pattern until now has been for weapons of mass destruction to be declared illegal by specific instruments. Uh, the most recent such instruments are the Convention on Biological Weapons uh, and the Convention on Chemical Weapons. Uh, so uh, in this understated way, the court was indicating that the way, the path towards uh, the global elimination of nuclear weapons should be through the negotiation of a global treaty to that effect, like the, the Chemical Weapons Convention. Um, and you know, I'm becoming increasingly convinced for a variety of reasons, some of which I just went through, just the incoherence of the existing regime, that, that we, need, uh, we, need such, uh, we need such an approach. Excellent, okay. So now, since we're, we're in uh, a law school, I. I wanted, and since I think it's important too, I want to talk a little bit about the concept of good faith. Uh, uh, in its uh, Article 6 of the Nonproliferation Treaty says that states are to negotiate nuclear disarmament in good faith. Um, when the ICJ interpreted uh, that provision of the NPT in its 1996 opinion, the ICJ said there is an obligation to pursue in good faith and bring to conclusion negotiations on nuclear disarmament and all its aspects under strict and effective international control. So good faith is built right into the text uh, of, of the NPT, but in, in fact uh, it, it isn't really totally necessary because good faith is required for the observance of all treaty obligations. Um, and then uh, uh, the NPT uh, was saying, in particular, uh, you must negotiate in good faith to, uh, on the elimination of nuclear weapons. Um, so I think it's worth developing both kind of a legal and but also sort of a, a popular understanding of what good faith means. Mohammed Bajawi said this um, at a conference we organized a couple years ago. Mohammed Bajawi was president of the International Court of Justice when it gave its nuclear weapons opinion. He said, good faith is a fundamental principle of international law without which all international law would collapse. 
Uh, and indeed, the Vienna Convention and the Law of Treaty provides uh, pacta sunt servanda. Every treaty in force is binding upon the parties to it and must be performed by them in good faith. This is a concept that dates back uh, millennia. The Roman justice uh, Justinian observed, what is so suitable to the good faith of mankind as to observe those things which the parties have agreed upon? Uh, now, the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, has uh, been quite strong in its statements about what good faith requires. It said in the Hungary-Slovakia case about, it was about construction of a dam, some difficulties the two countries were having in a joint project. Uh, the court said the principle of good faith obliges the party to apply a treaty in a reasonable way and in such a manner that its purpose can be realized. The court also said it, that it is the purpose of the treaty and the intentions of the party in concluding it which should prevail over its literal application. Uh, so uh, in, in, in a common sense way, what does good faith require? I would, I would summarize it this way. Good faith means keeping promises in a manner true to their purposes and working sincerely and cooperatively to attain agreed objectives. Uh, now, if we look at the obligation of good faith uh, negotiation of cessation, cessation of the nuclear arms race at an early date and nuclear disarmament um, under Article 6 of the NPT, has that obligation been performed so far in good faith? Um, well, I would say, since CTBT negotiations were concluded in 1996, the answer is basically no. Uh, fortunately, uh, we have seen resumption of negotiations in the past few months on uh, verified reductions of U.S. and Russian arsenals, and, and really that is about the only thing in the sphere of negotiating that I can point to since the CTBT was negotiated uh, in, in the nuclear sphere that, that seems to come under the category of good faith negotiations. <clears throat> uh, although there is an annual General Assembly resolution adopted by a very large majority calling for commencement of negotiations leading to the adoption of a convention, a global convention prohibiting nuclear weapons, there have been no deliberations or discussions of any kind on that on that subject. Uh, although in 1995, negotiation of a fissile materials treaty was something that was specifically promised in connection with the extension of the, of the NPT, there have been no negotiations so far on, on, on a fissile materials treaty. Now, that, that is an area where uh, the United States is not the only responsible party. China, in particular, has been dragging its feet on that uh, on that commitment uh, since uh, since 90, 1995, it's really it's really outrageous that the nuclear weapon states agreed to something specific in 1995 and have they've done very little on it uh, uh, since then. Um, so that is the state right now <coughs> of of compliance with good faith, um, the, the obligation of good faith negotiation of disarmament. And uh, as far as what we can look forward to uh, in coming months and years, uh, let me start with uh, the review conference. Uh, I'm, I'm part of the Middle Powers Initiative, uh, uh, which is a program of the Global Security uh, Initiative, Jonathan Granoff's organization, and sponsored by eight international organizations, including the Albert Schweitzer Institute and my international organization, the International Association of Lawyers Against Nuclear Arms. Uh, I put some of our recent uh, briefing paper that I wrote over, over on the side and it gives uh, a fairly comprehensive, not a totally comprehensive, but a fairly good list of uh, measures that we think uh, should be adopted by governments as commitments at the upcoming uh, review conference, which those of you who don't know, 
the five-year review conference for the NPT is going to be held at the UN in New York uh, starting May 3rd and going, going for uh, a month. And you certainly have the opportunity to come down and observe it. Uh, and I encourage you to do so and participate in various NGO activities. Uh, so in any case, Middle Powers Initiative has uh, uh, made recommendations, uh, suggestions about what governments could adopt at uh, this review conference, and I'm definitely not gonna go through all of them. A lot of them would be very familiar to you. Bring the test ban treaty into force, negotiate a fission materials treaty, reduce the role of nuclear weapons and security policies, and so on. But there's a couple I want uh, to focus your attention on. One is, uh, and this is new, and this is partly inspired by things that the UN Secretary General uh, Ban Ki-moon and uh, uh, High Representative for Disarmament Affairs, Sergio Duarte, who's sitting here in the front row, have been saying over the last few years, there is a lack of transparency and accountability regarding nuclear forces. Uh, Hans Christensen, who spoke this morning, is perhaps the leading NGO researcher in the world on, uh, on giving uh, estimates of what the uh, uh, nuclear weapons arsenals are. And maybe you can say something about this, Hans, but my understanding is that they are basically estimates uh, drawing only partly on official uh, information. Um, and so our view, Middle Powers Initiative view, but I think this is also the view of, of Ambassador Duarte and Secretary General Bond, is there, there needs to be a comprehensive UN-based accounting system covering size of nuclear arsenals, nuclear weapon delivery systems, fissile material stockpiles, and this is something that MPI put in. I don't know what uh, <coughs> um, Ambassador Doherty would say about this, but spending on nuclear forces. Um, this is something uh, uh, that is uh, uh, doable. Uh, it, it requires political will, but but is it is something that is is possible to get going. So I I commend it to the attention of the person from the State Department who is here today, uh, and we've actually uh, uh, the special representative for uh, nonproliferation Susan Burke was at a, a meeting Mill Powers Initiative organized a, a couple weeks ago. So we have brought these recommendations to her attention. The other thing that I want to uh, emphasize that the NPT Review Conference could do, <clears throat> that would be to set in motion a um, preparatory process for development of the framework for the, the global elimination of nuclear weapons in a sustain, sustainable, verifiable, and enforceable way. I'm not necessarily thinking, you know, maybe this is something that needs to become the subject of, you know, a global mobilization, the kind of which we have never seen before. Maybe that's true. But just from uh, the point of view of an analyst, um, uh, if your goal is to eliminate nuclear weapons, and that's the stated goal of governments, well, th to have a nuclear weapon-free world, there's going to have to be a legal and political framework uh, in, in which that is implemented. So why not start doing at least the preparatory work for developing uh, you know, what that framework uh, should be? So indeed, at the NPT PrepCom in 2009, there was, um, proposals before the governments that seem to have a, a pretty good degree of support uh, that would point towards uh, a development of, of a framework, you know, uh, deliberations or discussions regarding the framework for, uh, for a nuclear weapons-free world. So those are two things that I think that would go beyond the list of arms control measures that to many of us here are, are very familiar with and for good reason because they have been around literally since the founding of the NPT. Uh, I'm talking about the Test Ban Treaty, the Fiscal Materials Treaty, U.S.-Russia reductions, uh, limits or prohibitions on use of nuclear weapons. 
uh, well, we need to, we're in a new century, and we need to start thinking about how do we go beyond, we need to fulfill the existing arms control commitments, but how do we go beyond those as well? And so I've tried to give a couple of suggestions to that end. Thanks very much. Terrific. Now batting cleanup, Attorney Advisor Meha Shah. It's tough, tough to go last. Um, first, I'd like to thank uh, the university, the law school, and the institute for uh, having me here. It's a pleasure to be out talking about these issues um, outside Washington. And uh, it's a good opportunity to explain things and respond to some of the issues that have been raised today. Um, I think the single, well, I will start, um, I think I will focus on the MPT and the review conference, what we think will happen this May, um, what our expectations are, what are the challenges, in particular, how we would address those challenges on the ground, given my perspective um, as an MPT negotiator and a member of the delegation. And I think the single greatest challenge to the MPT, and it's been reflected in the comments of many of the speakers today, is how do we update our practices under the MPT to address challenges that have arisen since that treaty was drafted? Um, people who are familiar with the treaty know that it's, it's not very long. It's not as detailed as the Convention on, convention on um, Chemical Weapons. It's been noted. It doesn't have a complex uh, enforcement mechanism. There isn't um, a built-in mechanism for addressing noncompliance. Um, so it's a treaty that is of a different type from the uh, Convention on Chemical Weapons. Um, so how do we keep it relevant and effective over time? How do we evolve um, to address the challenges that weren't specifically contemplated in the 60s when it was written? Um, having said that, the MPT contains um, a powerful norm um, that nuclear weapon states will move towards disarmament, that they will not further distribute nuclear weapons, that non-nuclear weapon states will not develop nuclear weapons. Um, and that is something that is still um, important, even if it is simple um, in its application. But what is the basic bargain of the MPT that people talk about? The president has reaffirmed the basic bargain of the MPT. We've heard several panelists today talk about the bargain. Um, really, there are commonly understood to be three pillars of the MPT, disarmament, non-proliferation, and access to peaceful uses of nuclear energy. Um, and when the president says that bargain is sound, it's a recognition that in the negotiation of the MPT, there, there was a trade-off. Um, the nuclear weapon states are moving towards disarmament premised on the, um, the fulfillment of the non-proliferation obligations. Likewise, the non-nuclear weapon states agreed not to develop nuclear weapons premised on the promise of a movement towards disarmament. I think we have to recognize that that bargain goes both ways um, and that non-proliferation is as has been highlighted really by Ward just now, um, is a significant concern. And in creating the conditions for moving towards a, more, a world without nuclear weapons, we're gonna have to make the world more secure and increase our ability to address proliferation. Um, those are the three pillars, okay. Um, one thing I just mentioned, I'll elaborate a little bit, um, that is noted in absence from the MPT is the compliance mechanism. And both John and Ord uh, touched on this just now. Um, the MPT does not have a built-in non-compliance determination mechanism, and it also does not have um, an enforcement or response mechanism. And it's an Obama administration priority to address those challenges and try to strengthen our approach to non-compliance and enforcement. Um, how would we do that? I think Ord also very eloquently spelled out why we, it would be a challenge to amend the NPT. Um, there's the <coughs> process for amending the NPT, but also the political challenge of reopening the NPT to fix it, which would actually open the door to many more ideas to fix it. It would actually, I think, make it um, a very difficult negotiating challenge. So short of amending the treaty, how can we update our practice and implementation of the treaty? Um, I think next I should touch on why people um, refer to this year as a make or break year for the MPT. The 2010 review conference in May is, um, as, is referred to as something that must be a success. If it is not a success, it's a failure of the non-proliferation regime. And I'd like to explore a little bit why people say that, um, especially for the law students to give you a flavor for what set this, sets this up. 
Um, John, John actually um, mentioned in his keynote remarks the successes in 1995 and 2000 in previous review conferences. It's been mentioned there every five years. In between, we have three annual preparatory committee meetings. Um, in 1995 and 2000, we were able to successfully agree on a consensus outcome document. As Ward mentioned, generally the MPT members um, make decisions by consensus. Since then, we've been on a downward trajectory, I think, in producing outcomes from the MPT. Um, in 2004, the PREPCOM was unable to agree on an agenda. And in 2005, the review conference was stalled for several weeks because we could not agree on an agenda. It was considered and is considered today still to be a major diplomatic disaster, um, something we would not want to repeat. Um, so that puts a lot of pressure on the 2010 review conference to actually bounce back um, and produce something. Um, what is contributing to this atmosphere that led to the 2004 and 2005 disasters? Um, the non-aligned movement, the, the largest block of the negotiating countries in the MPT, um, the major non-nuclear weapon states and developing countries have a great distrust of um, the nuclear weapon states' commitment to the fulfillment of Article 6. I think I could just concede that up front um, over years of, in their view, um, a lack of progress towards disarmament. They've become very, very skeptical of nuclear weapon state um, commitments to fulfill that promise. And likewise, what this happens is that it um, encourages the NAM, the non-aligned movement, um, to, uh, well, it doesn't encourage them. They, um, the result is that they are unwilling to compromise on other aspects of the operation of the MPT, particularly, as Ord mentioned, in addressing non-proliferation. And they have an extremely strongly held view that if the <coughs> nuclear weapon states won't live up to their commitments, they should not be obligated to do more under the MPT. And that's what resulted in uh, the 2004 and 2005 dynamic. I think we're still seeing that dynamic somewhat um, in the preparatory committee meetings that will lead up to this maze. 2010 um, review conference. Um, the specific things they say, and they actually go into a very legalistic view of the MPT. They're very firm on what the MPT says, what is obligated, what is a right, and any movement to undermine those rights or add to those obligations is, um, is, is, gets a knee-jerk reaction from them. And any effort, I'll say this again, any effort to reopen the MPT to try to fix it, even on the non-proliferation or compliance aspects, will certainly lead the NAM to ask for their improvements to the MPT. And something that you hear often are targets and timetables for disarmament to improve on the, uh, the obligation to make good faith efforts to negotiate and turn it into an actual deadline. Um, as a negotiator and somebody who would be on the ground, I think this would be extremely challenging to deal with um, and not something that um, I would want to actually see happen. Um, the other pillar that I've mentioned but haven't talked about, the peaceful uses pillar, the NAM are also concerned about the fulfillment of their access to the benefits of peaceful uses of nuclear energy. And it's also been said by the NAM that they um, need more technology transfer and more commitments on technical assistance. So again, if we were to reopen the MPT to talk about nonproliferation, I would expect to have to also reopen the MPT on those fronts. Um, so what is the solution? You know, we, we don't want to amend the NPT. Um, but we have challenges that we need to address. We need to make progress on all three pillars. How do we do that? Um, John has mentioned at the outset the, um, the multiplicity, I think, of institutions that are involved in nonproliferation and where some people see schizophrenia um, or uh, a lack of coordination, I actually see opportunity. Um, so I will take you through a few of the specific nonproliferation challenges, which are of the greatest interest to the, to the United States government. Um, and talk a little bit about um, how we would address that challenge um, and uh, what it would mean in May on the ground in the review conference. Um, first, I think Ord has also already talked a good bit about the additional protocol and what we can do to keep the monitoring aspect of the MPT effective, um, and that is the safeguards requirement under Article 3 of the MPT, um, and how we can improve the, uh, the functioning of the IAEA and what they have access to, their authorities, um, 
and the coverage of those agreements. And he's already mentioned the additional protocol. Um, I think he said this, but I'm going to go over it again. The additional protocol was developed in, in the early 1990s to address a very specific challenge, and that is the inability of the IAEA to find undeclared material. Ord was right. The original premise of Article 3 was that nuclear material would be declared, and the IAEA's function would be to monitor it to make sure it wasn't diverted. But what do you do if there's undeclared material, and how can we find it and make sure it is brought under safeguards? Um, the most recent examples of challenges in this regard are the, the Syrian and Iranian revelations of undeclared nuclear facilities. Um, and those are very recent challenges in addition to the challenges of the, the North Korea, the DPRK's actions, um, and Iraq, which came earlier. Um, so working through the IAEA, and this was actually quite a diplomatic success, the, uh, there's a consensus was developed in the IAEA to develop a new protocol to the Comprehensive Safeguards Agreement. And getting the agreement of all the members of the IAEA to develop a new protocol and increase the safeguards burdens on parties to these safeguards agreement is really quite an achievement. It's still quite an achievement today. What we need now is to have the universalization of the additional protocol. The legal challenge, Ord already mentioned, the MPT does not require an additional protocol. There's no other international law requirement to sign up to an additional protocol. So how do we get the MPT parties to actually sign up to these additional commitments, knowing what we know about the NAM and their resistance to taking on additional legal obligations? Um, I think what we have to do the right thing to do is to convince the NAM that it's in their security interests as well. Um, the ability of the IAEA to effectively monitor nuclear activity worldwide, both declared and undeclared material, is, is, is a security benefit to everybody, not just the nuclear weapon states. And uh, you know, any non-nuclear weapon state or NAM member who's not planning on building undeclared facilities shouldn't be worried about having those additional burdens, but we need those for the exceptional countries, the few NPT parties who are not meeting their NPT obligations. That is a tough diplomatic sell, clearly. Um, and given the distrust of the NAM members over the lack of progress on disarmament, again, part of the effect of um, recent developments or lack of developments in Article 6 is, I can't overemphasize this enough, the negotiating challenge and what it means um, how, in terms of how difficult it is to convince countries to work with us on these things. And we had broad support for the additional protocol in the IAEA not that long ago. So much has changed in that dynamic in a short amount of time. Um, didn't say this, but it is a high priority of the Obama, Obama administration to universalize the, the additional protocol. We've been working on establishing this principle in a variety of fora, not just at the NPT. We talk about this all the time. And we're in a serious diplomatic effort to advance these ideas, not just at the NPT and not just at the review conference. You'll have to stay tuned to see if we can get um, agreement on that at the review conference this year. I really don't know. Um, all right, uh, the next challenge, um, Ord has also already mentioned this, detecting noncompliance and then enforcement measures. Um, it's also an Obama administration priority to strengthen the IAEA in that regard, and not just in terms of the additional protocol, but additional resources and training for inspectors. Um, resources for inspectors, technological innovations that would assist in um, inspections. So that's um, something that we can do at the IAEA that would again benefit the entire non-proliferation regime and, and indirectly strengthen the functioning of the NPT. Um, another thing that I'll touch on that is a very um, legal issue and something that preoccupies me greatly is the IAEA's lack of recourse to its existing inspection authorities. Ord mentioned the Comprehensive Safeguards Agreement. It has a special inspection mechanism under it. The IAEA has not used this inspection mechanism. And in fact, there's an IAEA board decision that special inspection should occur only rarely. Um, and this is uh, an implementation issue. It's not um, 
it's not a flaw in the NPT treaty, but it's uh, an implementation issue that we need to address. Um, you can have a treaty that says all the right things, but then if in practice um, the measures are not utilized as, as often as they should be, we have a problem, and that's something that we need to focus on. Um, again, maybe not at the review conference, and certainly um, in every other opportunity we have to work with the IAEA, it's something that we try to focus on. Um, Ward also mentioned enforcement for noncompliance and the use of the UN Security Council. Um, he's also mentioned, and this is true, that UN Security Council generally engages on this issue in a country-specific way. It's very rare. 1540 is quite exceptional, actually, in dealing with nonproliferation in a non-country-specific way. I mean, it would be a significant thing, probably a very difficult diplomatic challenge, to actually get the other UN Security Council members to agree to preemptive sanctions, automatic sanctions. <coughs> People give this idea different terms. Um, it would be very, very, very difficult to sell that issue in the UN Security Council. So when I see people talking about um, we can use a resolution to fix this or that, I think, well, wait a minute, how am I actually going to get the Security Council members to agree to that? Mm -hmm. If the Russians and the Chinese won't agree to additional sanctions on Iran now, what makes us think that they would set up a generic compliance um, and enforcement mechanism? So that's a serious challenge, although not you know, an idea worth discussing, but again, I'm framing this in the context of practical challenges that I see um, as a boots on the ground negotiator. Um, however, oh, to put a better spin on this, to put a better spin on this, I want to mention UN Security Council Resolution 1887. In September 2009, President Obama chaired a summit leader level meeting of the members of the UN Security Council. And out of that summit meeting, the um, Security Council agreed on a resolution that does begin to address noncompliance in a more general way. Um, 1887 links noncompliance with nonproliferation obligations generally and links it to the threat to international peace and security. And that is the requirement for UN Security Council action under Chapter 7. You need a threat to international peace and security. Um, however, since that time, interestingly, and maybe not surprisingly, we've heard a lot from the NAM. They're very dissatisfied with 1887. Don't think it was, um, they don't say democratic, but they don't think it was democratic. If they're not on the Security Council, they don't feel invested in that decision of the Security Council. We're going to see a lot of pushback on 1887, I think, in May at the review conference, which is unfortunate because I had originally thought 1887 was something of a success and that we could use that to create momentum going into May. But I'm, I'm going to walk that back a bit. I don't think I can be that excited. Um, I have so much to say, but I'm going to cut this short. There's one other challenge I want to mention. Um, that nobody else has mentioned yet, and that is addressing the spread of enrichment and reprocessing technology. For those of you who don't know what ENR is, enrichment is the front end of the fuel cycle. Um, it is the uh, purification, I think. I don't know that's a technical term, but it is the upblending of natural uranium into a form that can be used in a nuclear reactor or even more purified in weapons. Um, and in reprocessing is the back end of the fuel cycle. Once nuclear fuel has been irradiated, um, what you can do with the waste is pull out plutonium, which is also weapons material. Um, at the inception of the NPT, there were very few countries that produce that um, produced enriched uranium or possessed all aspects of the fuel cycle. Now there are many, many more countries that produce. Um, enrich uranium and possess the full range of the fuel cycle. Um, and this is a key issue with Iran, which I wanted to mention. Um, that is actually what they're fighting for, the right to continue to do. And the legal issue and the legal challenge under the MPT is it does not address ENR. Article 4 on the peaceful uses of nuclear energy reaffirms the right of parties to develop uh, nuclear energy for peaceful purposes. And that is the hat, uh, the hook on which Iran hangs its hat. They consider Article 4, many NAM members consider Article 4 to be an inalienable right. You cannot tell them that they cannot enrich uranium. You cannot tell them that they cannot possess all aspects of the fuel cycle. They, they think they can use it, and they can use it for peaceful purposes. Um, so engaging on the rights debate with them on this issue is very, very tricky. And I think the solution is to reframe 
the debate. Um, we're not undermining rights, but in creating a world that is more secure, that is less prone to proliferation, all countries would be able to benefit from access to nuclear fuel. And that can be supplied um, by supplier states. It does not have to be produced in-house, so to speak. Um, so that is a major issue, another Obama administration priority, which try to advance matters on that at the review conference. Again, we talk about this in a variety of other fora, um, and we would continue to do so before and after May um, and the review conference. But let me mention Iran again, too. Um, in fulfillment of the, our promise of Article 4 and access to the peaceful uses of nuclear energy, um, it, we had a very significant collaboration with the IAEA um, to propose providing Iran with fuel rods for the Tehran research reactor, which is a research reactor that they use to produce medical isotopes. And they had been saying that that reactor would run out of fuel in 2010. They have a difficult time because they're under UN sanctions from procuring fuel on the open market, and they are under a Security Council obligation not to continue to enrich uranium, so they shouldn't have been producing it in-house. Um, we worked in collaboration with the IAEA to try to find a way to get them the fuel rods for that reactor in a form that would actually be more proliferation resistant and actually take the, um, the enriched uranium that they have on site that they had produced in contravention of Security Council obligations. And we're very disappointed in the last week or so it's come out that Iran has completely rejected the offer. Um, but I was still want to use this as an example of how we can cooperate with countries on peaceful uses of nuclear energy and find a way to address the proliferation concerns at the same time. I, I believe passionately that there's a way to make those two things work. And I thought that was a very good example. Um, all right, I had many more examples of challenges, but I'm running out of time, so I'll get to my conclusion. Um, I think you have probably picked up on my penchant for looking at the non-proliferation regime in a greater context. Um, the NPT, the IAEA, uh, development of uh, fuel resources. Um, I think that that, for me, is um, the better way for me to look at the non-proliferation regime. I think, although it may be schizophrenic and sort of band-aided together, I think that we can address a lot of the challenges we see in different fora and hopefully create a strengthened institution where all of these elements can work together. Um, and I, I find hope in being able to do that. Um, that also means that I do not think I'm gonna say this pretty bluntly. I don't think the 2010 review conference for the NPT in May is the make or break event of the international non-proliferation regime. We are committed to making it a success. We're working very hard to find um, the common ground um, that will enable us to produce a consensus document in May. But if that doesn't happen, I will continue to do what I do in a range of other fora. Um, we've been working on those issues for months and months already, and we'll continue to do so afterwards. I'll just highlight the other big um, events of 2010 and what I see when I think about what I'm going to be doing for the next year. I already mentioned uh, 1887 and the Nuclear Security Summit from last fall. To me, that was the kickoff of my NPT prep. Um, there's a nuclear security summit, a leader level summit in DC in April in 2010. There are March, June, and September IAEA board meetings. Um, there should be ongoing FMCT negotiations in Geneva throughout the year. I haven't even mentioned START. We're in the middle of the START negotiations right now. So when I think of I haven't mentioned CTB, CTBT ratification as well. So when I look at the year, I see all those things, and I see an opportunity to make progress, to repair relationships, um, and to rebuild. Um, so thank you. Marvelous. Thank you, Meha. Um, when, a, when a program works well, the, the panelists have each contributed to a dialogue, and I think our pa panelists have clearly set up a dialogue. In order to uh, move it forward before set, inviting your participation, I thought I'd give each speaker the opportunity to make one point or one rebuttal or one clarification going in the same order. 
Right. Well, I like that that one limit, but uh, yeah, there was some very uh, <coughs> rich material to uh, uh, to think about. So, my my one point, I perhaps, would be about the uh, Security Council. Uh, <coughs> Uh, you suggested that, the, is, if I understood you correctly, that the Security Council could adopt uh, a requirement for all countries of entering the additional protocol. Is that, mm -hmm. is that right? Okay. Well, there, there's a problem with this, which you're aware of, uh, but, but that's that there is a lot of dissatisfaction and uh, among many of the world's countries about the uh, Security Council acting as a global legislator. They say, uh, what gives the Security Council uh, the power to do this? It's not in the UN Charter. Uh, the, the Security Council isn't representative in general. It's only 15 members. And beyond that, it's controlled by the Permanent Five, the vectors of World War II. Uh, the Security Council's uh, legitimacy tends to be, you know, very much in question on, on a, a number of fronts, <clears throat> and I, I, my my tendency would be to to think much more along the following lines, and that is, to deal as much as we can with the problem of proliferation in Iran and elsewhere on a case by case basis, to not uh, be uh, too alarmist uh, about it. You know, a lot of countries have joined the NPT over the last couple of decades. There have been some countries that pursued nuclear weapons and given them up. So it's a mixed story regarding uh, the success of the NPT. But to pursue uh, nonproliferation on a case-by-case -case basis and for something like the additional protocol and the other improvements that need to be made to the nonproliferation disarmament regime, find a way, it's going to be hard, find a way to do it in a multilateral fashion that, will, that, that you'll get buy-in from the world on it. One example of a place to do that could be negotiation of a fissile materials treaty. It could be part of the bargain for the fissile materials treaty, the nuclear weapons states, accept the additional protocol for their, uh, for their activities and, and, and the non-nuclear weapon states accept it as an additional non-proliferation obligation. Um, I have so much to say. <laughs> um, my one thing to say, um, I'm gonna have to pile on toward and agree with John on the limits of recourse to the Security Council. Um, I don't think that's a well you can go back to many times. Um, a Chapter 7 resolution is a significant thing and imposes legal obligations on all UN members. Um, and yes, we've used it for 1540, but given the response I've seen to 1887, I'm not sure it would come at that type of resolution would come at a high cost, I think. Um, one of our other preoccupations, um, one of my other pre preoccupations and another one of the Obama administration's priorities is addressing uh, withdrawal from the NPT. And uh, I shudder to think, to contemplate whether countries would leave the NPT um, in response to being forced to adopt an additional protocol under UN Security Council resolution. So we'd have to be prepared for maybe the unintended consequences of pursuing um, that type of measure. Although I'm sympathetic to the idea of it because we do have very few options. Um, there are very few things we can do to actually impose consequences um, for non-compliance with the NPT. So I'm sympathetic, but then have many practical concerns. No. Okay. We'll wait for, wait for okay. a question to give you the opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> so here, here are your opportunities. Um, in light of the time, though, please make sure that you're asking a sharp question and direct, or, you know, a question with a, a real interrogatory and directed toward one or more of the speakers. Yes, sir. One of the things that was discussed was tools available to the IAEA, including you know, CSA and the uh, additional protocol. 
but what about uh, questions of you know confidentiality? You see consistently in you know the, the director general reports that you know calling for more openness uh, from member states in what the data that they're giving to the IAEA. Um, certainly, there's member state concerns over you know what's going to happen to their classified data. But what are the prospects of like? Um, to help the IAEA, you know, conclude investigations more quickly, and you know, ultimately, uh, you know, stop liberation. Can I start? Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> um, I think confidentiality of information or intelligence sharing, actually. Um, would raise a lot of issues with us. I'm, I'm not steeped in the cooperation we have now with the IAEA on their investigations of other countries. We probably do support them in some fashion with information that we can share. Um, classified information, intelligence information would be a whole nother level of um, cooperation that may not be possible. But I know there's some other things that countries can share um, that's not necessarily confidential. Information on trade flows, um, export and import information, I think that's an area where you can actually um, increase the amount of information available to the IAEA um, in a way that's helpful but also protects um, national security interests. Um, the other thing, and I touched on this, but uh, didn't elaborate on it too much because it's technical, but there's probably a lot of training and technical support we can give IAEA inspectors, improved equipment. Um, we already um, let the IAEA practice, so to speak, safeguards on facilities in the United States. They're not so much concerned about diversion here as they are about enhancing their techniques and more of that on the ground cooperation um, and letting them practice, I think, would also probably be helpful. So there's probably a lot we can do um, short of sharing classified information that would still be very, very helpful. It's a good question. Follow-up question? Um, very quick question. Um, is the additional protocol signed by the country so far that we've signed it, is it identical in form or is it somewhat tailored to each country's needs or situation? My understanding is that it's fairly identical to the model. There's a lot of there's a lot of variation in comprehensive safeguard agreements. So I think that in a CSA, you actually find more variations. But I think by and large, on the AP, they conform to the model. Now, having said that, I don't have access to every country's additional protocol, so I haven't looked at them. But that would be my understanding. This question from one of our student leaders. Yes. Um, this question is for Ms. Shah. Um, as a negotiator for the U.S. State Department and in view of the upcoming conference, I was wondering what your view is on how the U.S.'s movement to modernize nuclear infrastructure that uh, Mr. Roth talked about at length might impact your position in negotiations at the upcoming review conference, or at least on the attitudes of other states' parties vis-a-vis um, -vis our obligations under the treaty. I'm no fool. I think everything that Nick talked about this morning is susceptible to a high degree of skepticism. Um, it really remains to be seen how sincere other countries think we are. I think a lot of countries have been holding their breath since the election and waiting to see what the Obama administration will do. And we've had a little bit of a honeymoon, but the rubber's going to have to meet the road. And I think Coming up into May, if we don't demonstrate that sincerity, um, if we don't find a way to explain those appropriations and what they really mean, um, it's going to be a problem. I, I think our delegations um, to the review conference will be fully staffed by the interagency, and I would expect DOE to be able to answer those questions and to, to speak to that. Um, and we'll certainly tell them they have to be prepared for that before we get there. But this is all evolving um, in real time. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, it certainly gives me something to think about. Yes, sir. I find this discussion limited to nuclear weapons to be in itself a problem, in particular related to 
the question of how other countries respond to the United States and the skepticism that you just mentioned. The, the Obama administration, it seems to me, continues and expands on the policy <coughs> of, uh, pre pre of predecessors to build foreign bases, to surround Russia and China with missiles, to threaten. Remember, we're looking for a quick question. I've got, well, I'm, pre I'm premising this with the context. I think it's important to state the context. Otherwise, there's no meaning to the question. The, the Obama administration has not taken off the table a nuclear strike on Iran. That, to me, is, is a violation of international law. Now, I'm not a lawyer, so you can tell me that. But to the extent that the Obama administration acts very aggressively, it may, it may be negotiating, it may be talking, but it acts, and I think that most of the world is responding to this in a very aggressive way to the rest of the world. Why should we expect that world, the non-aligned movement, to, uh, to, to drop its skepticism, if not cynicism, about nuclear weapons? And that's, that's, I think that's the question. How, how do we, in, in this larger context, how do we expect them, the non-aligned movement, to say, well, everything has changed. Obama said it's changed, therefore it's changed. But in fact, when we look at it, it hasn't changed. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Henry. Uh, you know, I think that uh, nuclear weapons should not be thought of as weapons. Uh, they, they should be thought of as uh, devices that, that shouldn't uh, exist. Uh, and uh, it's troubling to me that when uh, we finally uh, start hearing from the United States in particular, but also other countries to a lesser degree, uh, uh, about the, the possibility of moving towards the elimination of nuclear weapons, uh, we, we, th we then start to hear both from analysts and uh, quite directly from Russia, uh, look, we're not going to be able to think about going low on, on, on nuclear weapons or about their elimination so long as the United States is pursuing advanced uh, strategic non-nuclear strike systems, space-based systems, uh, anti-missile systems, uh, in short, that it's going to be hard to go to low levels or to elimination of nuclear weapons uh, if the United States has overwhelming uh, military superiority. Well, I, I find this very troubling uh, because I, I, I don't really want to see uh, nuclear weapons uh, become more than they already are, sort of bargaining chips for we want X before we'll think about giving up ours. Uh, I, I don't think that's the, the, the right way to, uh, uh, to think about these devices. They shouldn't be thought of in, in an ordinary kind of political, security, strategic way. Uh, they're out of this world devices. Having said all that, <laughs> I think it's going to be a reality that th there is going to have to be, as, as Ambassador Duarte has said in some of his speeches, there's going to be, have to be complementary arms control uh, on uh, space and missile and anti-missile systems in particular uh, and uh, strategic strike systems. Uh, to be successful in going to low levels in, in eliminating nuclear weapons. But it's not something, and this is what I've been trying to convey, it's not something we should easily accept. Uh, we may recognize it's, it's a reality, but I think we should be saying to Russia and other countries, you know, just like anybody else, you have to realize these, these devices are wrong and shouldn't exist. Uh, the last question for Ambassador Duarte. Thank you. I, I really have a comment to make and then a question. The comment has to do with the previous question that was asked about the efficient protocol. 
and the additional protocol that is signed by the nuclear weapon countries is fundamentally different from that that is signed by the non-nuclear weapon countries. But this is a fact that is very seldom uh, acknowledged by the nuclear countries themselves. They say, we have signed the additional protocol, so why don't you? Of course, the nuclear countries are very much there. Okay, now the question is uh, to lawyers. Uh, I was trained as a lawyer, but I think when I, when I decided I was probably not going to make a good lawyer, I decided to be a diplomat. I don't know if I'm good, <laughs> good diplomat. <laughs> but the, having been trained as a lawyer, definitions are, are very important in, in, in the law business. We know that. So my question is to the lawyers here. When does a non-nuclear weapon country party to the NPT violate Article 2. Article 2, if I, I remember certainly so right, says that you cannot acquire a nuclear weapon or a nuclear weapon or a nuclear explosive device. Now, when do you acquire a nuclear weapon or a nuclear weapon explosive device? Is it when you assemble an or, a, a warhead? Is it when you when you detonate a test? How do you how do you define the acquisition of a nuclear weapon? Why are you asking this question? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Here's what Article 2 says. Each non-nuclear weapon state party of the treaty undertakes not to receive the transfer from any transfer whatsoever of nuclear weapons or other nuclear explosive devices or of control over such weapons or explosive direct, uh, devices directly or indirectly and, and, but here's the next phrase I think you're thinking of. Not to manufacture or otherwise acquire nuclear weapons and not to seek or receive any assistance in the manufacture of nuclear weapons or uh, other nuclear explosive devices. <coughs> well, uh, I'll, I'll take a first crack at, at commenting on this. Um, <clears throat> Uh, this, this provision has been interpreted by some to mean you have not violated the NPT until you have assembled uh, a, a nuclear weapon. Uh, <coughs> but uh, there's uh, a, a lot of uh, uh, feeling that it should not be limited uh, to, to such a narrow reading. Uh, and, and, one basis, and one basis for that is to say uh, that um, in 1995 and 2000, as you know, um, the, uh, the states' parties to the Non-Proliferation Treaty agreed that the Article IV right to peaceful uses of nuclear energy should be subjected not only, uh, they committed that it was uh, subject not only to Compliance with Article One, Articles One and Two on non-acquisition, but also Article Three on compliance with safeguards. Well, this seemed to indicate a movement towards, uh, you know, realizing what was true from the start that it, it was it's a it's a process of acquiring a nuclear weapon it involves making the materials, and assembling the device and uh, producing the the components. I don't know if you would. We're, yeah. we're really short on time. So um, I think there's enough flexibility in the text of Article. I think there's enough flexibility in the text of Article Two to cover a variety of situations. Um, Shocker's book on the history, his compilation on the negotiating history of the MPT, has a section on the discussion of Article Two. And at one point during the negotiating history of the MPT, there was an effort to. Um, define what would be covered by Article 2, um, which was unsuccessful. I think getting into the details um, engendered a lot of disagreement, which is why Article 2 is written in such a general way. I think it gives us some flexibility. Um, manufacture doesn't necessarily have to be an entire weapon, um, but where we draw that line may depend on, a, on the specific facts at hand. So. That's probably a little too diplomatic and not lawyerly enough, <laughs> but I think that's the best I can do right now. In order to preserve five minutes for coffee and bathroom break, I would ask you to um, um, 
hold your, your response till your presentation, which is in about five minutes, and then uh, to thank these brilliant lawyers for their, their uh, interventions.